Well, hey, welcome everybody to uh, the Inventor Center of Kansas City and our June meetup. Thank you for being here this evening. Glad that you could join us. Uh, how's everybody doing tonight? Yeah, good, good, excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, we will get rolling here. We've got, a, I think, a really nice slate for you here this evening of uh, information and speakers. Uh, my name is Kurt McMillan. I'm the president of the Inventor Center of Kansas City. And I'm um, here with, of course, our board and some great uh, people here who have uh, been diligently working this year to, to make a lot of magic happen. We've got some really good stuff cooking right now. And I will uh, tell you about a couple of those things. Uh, as you look up here, we have a brand new website uh, put up. Come on all around the block, right? Uh, we have been uh, working diligently on getting that done. It's been a lot of the tooth, but we finally got it done. So if you go to inventorcenterofkc.org is the URL, inventorcenterofkc.org, you can pull this up. And uh, you'll find there's a lot of information there. We have uh, information about our upcoming events. So in particular, a lot of people are interested to know what, are, what is the next event, what is it going to be, and when is it. Uh, so you can go to our event schedule, and you can see not only the uh, next event, but some of them that will be upcoming. Um, we'll also have some information on how you can be a speaker if you're interested in being a hotshot, being a keynote. Um, what's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I guess it would help to look at the rest of the page here. But um, there is information there on how you can be one of our keynote speakers or a hotshot if you're interested. So uh, you can click there and, and find out some information. And as um, click that here. And there's a, a form there you can fill out. Just let us know that you're interested. And we'll be happy to, to talk to you about what you have. Um, there's also, you can see there's a sign up for email. So if you are not currently on our email list, please do sign up uh, and uh, put yourself in the database so that you can get our regular uh, emailings. Uh, we'll have a newsletter that's gonna be starting up here pretty soon as well as our events and meeting reminders. So uh, if you haven't signed up for email, please uh, be sure to do that. Uh, we have some other information there and great ways for you to get involved in the ICKC. So when you get a few minutes, pull it up, uh, rat through it, and uh, let us hear from you. If you have some comments, you see something uh, that, uh, that is not working or working really well, let us know either way. We want to hear from you. Uh, appreciate any and all feedback. Okay, so that takes care of the website uh, portion. Uh, another item that we have coming up is the Maker's Fair. Uh, how many people know about Maker's Fair next weekend? Coming to make Oh, great, okay, nice. So I don't have a lot of explaining to do. So uh, I uh, hope that you all can make it down. It's going to be a great weekend. That's uh, next weekend, not this coming, but the following, June 28th and 29th, Saturday and Sunday at Union Station. And that will be 10 to 6 on Saturday and 10 to 5 on Sunday, Maker's Fair. I believe it, uh, it's like $12, I think, for an adult ticket. Um, and Yeah, $35 family fees where everybody can get in. So yeah, if you, uh, if you can, please uh, come down to the fair. Uh, you will have a fantastic time. We've been talking about it quite a bit for several months. Uh, there is a lot to see and to and people to meet. Um, if you've never been before, it's a great experience. We will have a booth. The ICKC will have a booth. We are also going to be featuring some different um, inventions. Uh, by local inventors uh, in our booth. If uh, we had a few of you who volunteered to bring your item to our booth, if there is someone out there who was not asked or didn't have the opportunity to let us know, um, we'd like to talk to you and maybe uh, give you the opportunity to bring your product to our booth and put it in there and feature it. Our booth will uh, hopefully highlight a lot of the great creativity and inventions that are happening right here in, in Kansas City. So if uh, you haven't had that opportunity to, uh, to talk to somebody about that, please seek one of us out and let us know. Um, we also have a form, I think, in that regard. You haven't heard, right? Is that a little uh, form? <clears throat> Uh, if you want to go ahead and pass those out, we have a little questionnaire uh, that Kurt's going to hand out. A few of you may. If you don't have one of these. Yeah, anybody that didn't get the questionnaire? Okay. We, uh, we handed a few of these out at the last meeting, um, and you may have filled one out before. If you did, that's okay. If you haven't, please fill this out. It has a few general questions about uh, um, the Maker Fair coming up. Uh, it, I think it has a question about whether or not you want to have your product in our booth. Uh, there's also questions um, about uh, getting involved with us in our, uh, our own event that we'll be having in the fall, which I'm going to talk about in a second, Make 48. Um, so if you could just quickly fill that out and give us a little feedback, let us know if you'd like to be involved. We'd, we'd love, to, uh, love to hear from you. Um, so yeah, Maker Fair. Please come down to, to Maker Fair next weekend. It is, it is going to be absolutely uh, fabulous, and um, we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you all there. Um, and then that brings us to a third item that we've been working quite a bit on, and you'll hear more about uh, as we progress, and that's our own event happening in the fall, Make 48. Some of you have heard about it, know about it. As a reminder, uh, it is a, uh, it's going to be a unique event. It's a, an invention contest. 
But unlike a lot of invention contests, we're not going to have people come prepared with their product. They're actually going to spin the product up over a 48-hour period. They will be issued a challenge from a company who's going to be looking for a particular kind of product. And teams will compete over 48 hours to plan, prototype, and pitch their product idea for a commercial product. And we think this is, is going to be extremely unique. We're going to be uh, partnering with a couple of the fab labs here in town. Uh, so we will have the tools and the facilities for these teams to do this work. And uh, it'll be crazy. Uh, it'll be frantic. And it should be a lot of fun. And hopefully, in the end, it'll produce some really fabulous ideas and uh, really feature uh, the best of what we have here in Kansas City, our tools and our talent. And I think it'll be a great showcase for that. So we've been working quite a bit on that. Make 48, that is going to be in the fall. The second weekend in November, November 14th, 15th, and 16th. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 14th, 15th, and 16th. Uh, on the 14th, we're going to have a keynote day. Uh, that will, And all this will, by the way, take place at Union Station. Uh, on November 14th, we will have a day of keynotes. Uh, you can come down. We'll have a, a variety of speakers on various topics uh, that we'll talk throughout the day. It'll be an extremely informative day, open to the public. Uh, and so we hope that you can come down uh, and join us for that. Some great conversation dialogue. That night, we are going to have uh, cake and cocktails, uh, a little reception afterwards. We're going to celebrate the 10th uh, year of Icy Casey. This is our 10-year anniversary. So we're going to have a little birthday party and have our cake and a few cocktails and celebrate 10 years that evening. And then Saturday, we'll begin the competition. The teams will receive the challenge Friday afternoon, and they will go to work, and then over the course of Saturday into Sunday afternoon, and working 24 hours all night long and into Sunday, they will work on these ideas, and it will conclude Sunday afternoon. Uh, we will then have an award ceremony with a panel of judges. Uh, the teams will pitch their ideas, and uh, winners will be awarded. Uh, so, yeah, that's Make 48, second weekend in November, 14th, 15th, and 16th, and we will uh, be sharing a lot more information on that uh, as we go along. We'll give you more details uh, on what's going to be involved, who will be coming and speaking, and, and the various uh, details about it. Okay, well, I think that, uh, for the most part, I think concludes uh, my quickie uh, announcement, so we'll get on with our speakers, and uh, to introduce our speakers, I'm going to bring on our illustrious CEO, Sean Murphy, everybody. Sean Murphy. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Good. All right, I think we have a really, really valuable program for you this evening. We're going to actually talk about fab labs, fabri fabrication labs, because one of the challenges that inventors have is we're really, really, really creative here, right? Mm -hmm. And might even be creative on paper or be creative, <laughs> create a three dimensional image maybe on a computer, but how do you build something and get it in your hand and a prototype that you can test and what do you make it out of and where would I get this done and I need this kind of part out of metal and I need this kind of part out of plastic and I need this thing out of whatever, whoever knows what. And what, first of all, where can I find that type of equipment and how much would that kind of equipment cost? And if I could even find one to buy, I sure don't know how to run it. And so people just go, well, what the heck. So a fabrication lab is where you have all of that in one place. You can show up and say, look, Here's what it looks like. Here are the dimensions. I need this thing created, and I need this portion of it in plastic. I need one in red. I need one in blue. I need whatever the case. But to have the ability to have expert technicians that, that have the equipment and actually understand how to operate it, so you don't have to make the investment in the equipment and you don't hurt yourself trying to learn how to operate it, which also would be pretty nice. But we have Dave Dalton, who's actually the owner of uh, Hammer Space, which is a fab lab right here. He's going to talk to you about his program, uh, what he has available, and how you can actually use that to move your invention forward. So give him a big hand. Dave Dalton. Throw some uh, images up here. So. No, I got it. Dave and I run Hammerspace Community Workshop in Brookside. Uh, 
We are a facility that helps creative people remove those linchpin <coughs> obstacles that they have in their path to creativity. So when you have an idea, there's always a few things that are stumbling blocks to completing your vision and having the right amount of space, the right kind of tools, or that last little bit of knowledge or skill that you lack to complete some project keeps most creative endeavors from ever reaching completion. And uh, I kind of grew up in an environment where everyone around me was creative. My father is a designer. My grandfather on my mother's side was an aeronautical engineer in the golden era, era of aviation. Uh, worked for Hughes out of the TWA overhaul base like, on things like a super, the super constellation. So, um, when I saw him build a steam engine in his garage and then shove it in a Ford Pinto and drive it for the next 15 years, <laughs> I got the idea that when you have an idea, you just pursue it. Uh, it doesn't matter how ludicrous it is because uh, we have opposable thumbs and we can solve these problems. And sometimes they're problems that don't even need to be solved, but they're things you'd like to do anyway. And the Wright brothers gave us human flight because they had a workshop that was already paid for. They sold bicycles, and that paid for those tools that gave everyone in the world some new ability that they didn't have before. And it was idle time on paid for tools, and dreamers using that opportunity to everyone's advantage. And if you could put these workshops everywhere, then everyone with a great idea would have the opportunity to pursue that idea without obstacles. And tools are not expensive, it's the space and the maintenance and just keeping them from falling to rust sitting in people's basements. Most tools go to their graves with only 10% of their useful life used up. And I want to make sure that all the tools that pass through my hands go to their graves because every last ounce of usefulness was extracted from them. People make amazing things. So, how we do that is we provide that space and power and facility and tools and knowledge and uh, experience with material science and how you apply the tools at our disposal to a variety of problems. And we are able to do that because we live in an era where the cost of these smart robotic tools is dropping at an incredible rate. It's sort of equivalent to the explosion of uh, computers. And we've kind of reached a plateau there where it's slowing down a little bit. But right now, the, the digital fabrication realm is just exploding at the same rate. Uh, what's brought a lot of us together is 3D printing, which people talk about a lot. And that's what's driven a lot of spaces like this, is the fact that what used to be a $35,000 machine is now uh, 2800 to 1500 to maybe even if you built it yourself off of open source plans and a friend's printer, maybe a $400 printer or a $200 printer that does what five years ago would have taken a $40,000 Stratasys to produce. And it makes better models, durable things, useful parts, gears and cams and cases and things that are useless ephemera and incredibly functional prototypes. Uh, they allow us to have a really fast speed of, of iteration on our, on our ideas. Um, here's a whole room of 3D printers. This is a little open source 3D printer called a Prusa Mendel. And you're looking at uh, a build that we had when we were a new space two years ago where we built 20 of these 3D printers using one mother printer. Uh, and each one of those printers has probably printed two or three more printers in its lifespan. So this is a, this is a technology that spreads like a Xerox machine. And it, it's here to stay. Uh, Michael Curry, who's one of our members, left us for two years to go work for MakerBot in New York, designing amazing things. He, he caught their attention because he was sitting here in Kansas City and was an architect looking for a job and discovered 3D printing and started drawing things that were in his mind that architects don't get to see most of what they draw. Someone else gets to build it. 
but with a 3D printer in his hands, all those skills that he developed became engineering skills. Uh, and uh, yes, thanks, Windows, probably. Uh, I'm going to blame Windows, even if they're not a fault. Um, so, uh, I don't know what you're doing. But to see him blossom from someone who was pure design to someone who can make anything that he can imagine by drawing it and printing it out. And just, uh, just this past month, he, uh, he completed a 3D printed vehicle that's the size of an ATV. It's the largest 3D printed single mechanism I have ever seen. And uh, it's strong enough to carry a child and remote control. And the entire drivetrain from differentials to uh, the CV joints and suspension arms, everything is 3D printed except for the electric motor and a drive chain. Uh, you can fit the non-3D printed parts in a one gallon bucket. Um, these things will be on everyone's desk and in everyone's home in the next five years because the cost to produce these things is dropping and the utility of the items that they produce is increasing and when you think about how much people invent that is based on the shape of some widget some useful assemblage of shapes that does some function, whether it's a doorstop, or a coat hook, or an iPhone case, or any of a million other products that are what they are because of their intrinsic shape, and they're mostly made of plastic. These things are going away as something that you go to the store and buy. They'll be there for some things for a long time, but the way we think about these shapes and these objects will change in the way we think about, you know, making a sign for your garage sale using a printer 30 years ago ludicrous, 20 years ago commonplace. Now, you know, pretty soon we'll have printers that print OLED ink that you can put a battery on the side and the whole sign lights up and you can see it from space for your garage sale. So, <laughs> These things are going to change at an accelerating rate, and in order to be at the forefront of that and take advantage of it, because that's where inventors live, is at the edge of new technologies, uh, this, is, this is where the opportunity for great ideas occurs, is when there's new things brewing together and mixing for the first time. And to do that, you go to spaces like this, because this is where you have woodworkers and blacksmiths and electrical engineers and embedded systems programmers and web designers and special effects technicians and radio control freaks and ham radio operators and computer security professionals and wireless communications professionals bumping elbows and sharing projects and trading ideas and there is nowhere in the world that you can get this diversity of expertise for the virtually free price of a friendly hand on the other side of the table saw when someone needs to cut something. Um, this is that you know neighborhood fix-it shop where everyone gets together and works on their dreams, rediscovered because we've lost that. Uh, you know the the factories that produced all the amazing things when those guys got off of work and the extra two hours they spent there with their friends working on a hot rod or, or whatever, those days have faded. And where do you go for that? Not everybody has a handy grandpa or a, uh, you know, that, that friend with every tool. So for the rest of us, shared spaces offer an opportunity to fill in the gaps in your knowledge and share projects, learn basic woodworking, build quantum encabulators. <laughs> Uh, this is an air-powered rocket launcher that we do around the 4th of July. Uh, aluminum smelting. There's some of the cast objects made out of styrofoam and then converted to metal. All recycled aluminum cans. 
Uh, electric bass guitar entirely made at the space on the CNC machine. That gal is eight years old and she did aluminum casting and made her sister's name in aluminum and gave it to her for a birthday present. I mean, all ages come together and work on everything from Lego engineering to two axis flame organs that respond to music, t shirt cannons that look like howitzers. Uh, there's no limit to what you can use these tools to pursue uh, to your creative ends. Um, you know, it's a brainstorming chair. Uh, but uh, I'm really proud of the diversity of the folks who come and use our space. I mean, it's, it's, it's men, it's women, it's children, it's uh, retirees. Uh, we have an 87-year-old retired judge who sculpts marble and casts bronze. Mm -hmm. And he's in a retirement home here, and he says, you know, it's so nice to get away because they give him the rounded scissors at craft time. And he's like, I had six outbuildings full of tools. I'm, I've progressed beyond the round scissors now. Uh, so it's, you know, it's nice now that he doesn't have access to those tools anymore, that he still has access to those tools. And, uh, and so, you know, we... Uh, you know, work on silversmithing. It was a set bezel class with a stone. And we have a kid's room full of all sorts of uh, entertaining uh, engineering toys for the smaller ones. Paper projects. Uh, there's really, really no limit. While this goes on, does anybody have any questions for me? Because I'll talk all day. I think definitely want you to touch on what are your hours? What is your location? <coughs> do I do a, a monthly fee? Can I show up one time? For one hour, I go, I just need this, and you'll never yeah, see me again. How's we're, it work? we're like a gymnasium. So you get a monthly membership. It's only $50 a month for an individual, uh, $100 for a corporate membership, which includes two memberships. So it's really the same price, but we ask that if you're a company, you step up and get a couple of memberships for someone else in your company other than the boss. And, uh, and uh, come down and and check out the place. We have family memberships which run 75, so that's two adult memberships and any associated children. And that gives you access to the facility during the time that Iris, the robotic uh, overlord of the space, allows access to the front door, which is 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., <coughs> seven days a week. Uh, my office hours are 11 to 8, uh, six days a week. And so during those times, you have access to me and seven or eight other individuals around the space. Now. The really important thing to remember about Hammerspace is it's not just Hammerspace, there's also built-to-spec design, which is the other end of Makerspaces. Makerspaces help you work on projects on your own, develop things with a hands-on approach, but then there's the other side of it. There's things that it doesn't matter how long you spend on it, that's not where your skills lie. Um, sometimes you need one laser cut part or one 3D printed gear or some other thing in a larger project, and you don't have time to stop and learn how to become an expert at 3D printing or figure out how to operate a laser cutter. You just want a part, and that's where built to spec comes in. And Craig and Jordy and myself also have a separate business there that serves our commercial customers. So you can come in with uh, a thumb drive with uh, a vector artwork in there and say, I'd like to have this cut out on quarter inch plexiglass with an etching pattern and there's the file, and come back three hours later and pick up your parts. There is nowhere within a thousand miles of here where someone who isn't a very large company can walk in and get laser cut parts same day. It just isn't a thing. They're full all the time, everywhere. Um, we've got a, a, a nice setup with now five CNC lasers so there's no waiting, and they're always full of other commercial jobs that we're doing. But for little jobs, you have to stop in between cuts and clean out the machine. And throwing your parts on and cutting them in for two minutes is no skin off our nose. And it's wonderful to be able to come in and fill those gaps and not have to feel like you've got to go to a machine shop or employ an engineer to get some advanced parts. Let's get some more questions from the audience here. Yeah. Yeah, I've got pamphlets up here at the front. So 
No, I, I don't. Um, yes. Uh, so, how, how do you go from a, a 3D a printed prototype to like an actual machine part? How do you figure how to do that? Well, there's a, a couple of different ways to attack that. Uh, depending on what you need, it can be anything from milled from one of our CNC milling machines or cut out with a router or laser cut or 3D printed and we, we do a lot of 3D prints to cast metal. Uh, it's a fairly easy process. If you need an aluminum part, you can print it out, invest it, burn it out, and cast it. So we have kind of a unique combination of super modern digital tools and really traditional lost wax casting equipment. So you combine the two. Traditionally, to make things uh, in aluminum, uh, there's shrinkage. Like uh, it's about 2% to 3% in aluminum, depending on what the alloy is. And once you know what that is, you can actually tell the 3D printer to scale up your object by 3% and invest it, cast it, and when you get done, it'll be back with intolerances. So trying to do that with a, you know, a part that you're having to mold off of a real life thing is virtually impossible, so. Is a 3D modeling class ever teach you classes where you show the person how to actually do the, run the machine? Yes, yes we do. Um, we have, physical hands-on classes that teach you how to do everything from woodworking to blacksmithing to running a 3D printer or preparing a file for a laser cutter and we have teachers that are part of our membership and guest teachers that come in to teach everything from operating CNC machines to operating airbrushes uh, to using a vinyl cutter to make signage and, and so on. Soft crafts, sewing, Life casting. Uh, you do not have to wow. be a member to take a class. There's generally a discount, though. There's Nick's face. There's Nick. <laughs> and Pat teaches our woodworking classes uh, and does some really fabulous uh, uh, vacuum tube amplifiers. Mid-century modern, super, super posh looking. <coughs> But Any other questions? I, I think one of the, the coolest uh, things about, can you tell them about Open House? Because that's how yeah. I actually found out about this about three weeks ago, when the, the, the next Thursday, and now I'm a member. And it's, uh, if you haven't been there, you just, you just got to go. If you can tell them about Open House. Yeah, every Thursday we have an open house where we invite the, the general community in to come and check out projects that we're working on at the space and get a tour of the facility and meet the members of the space and encourage uh, new membership to come in. Uh, uh, six o'clock p.m. To, to nine o'clock, although it's never stopped at nine ever. Uh, people get talking, uh, so generally we've, we've got to kind of push them out the door with the broom. So. I should have said one other thing too. After you do the tour, just walk over. There's there's always people working. Just walk up and say, what are you working on? That's all you need to say, and you'll be there for about another hour. Yeah, everything from laser communication to home automation systems to automated robotics and hover drones and 3D printed cars and sonic screwdrivers and special effects, prosthetics. Can you tell us exactly where you're located and how to get there? Because I know it's a little bit sure. different than going in the front door. Uh, we're in we're in the Brookside area. We're on 63rd Street, a block from Oak. Uh, so just over the hill from downtown Brookside. It's 440 East 63rd Street. And uh, feel free to grab a pamphlet up front here. It's got our website address, which is full of all kinds of information about stuff that we do. Uh, super awesome, Sylvia. Hey, can I ask a question regarding yeah. the computer work that might be essential to run your 3D printed piece? Do you have the computer equipment that you would need there? Do you have the people that can help you? Yes, absolutely. Kind of we have uh, five computer workstations in our computer workstation area uh, from uh, the two portable laptops and three desktops that have preloaded software, everything from Hexagon to Cut2D 
to Google SketchUp, all of these different sculpting programs, Cura for slicing up things for the 3D printers. Uh, we make it easy so you don't have to hunt down the software, and it's pre-installed, but we, we use it for our classes where we teach folks. And we encourage people to bring in their laptops for classes and go through the process of helping them install software and, and find resources uh, as part of our class. There's a, a classroom space in, in the building where we have a projection screen, a whiteboard, and desks, and, you know, of course, Wi-Fi and, and, uh, and all of that. So. Did you say how you charge for materials that you use? Well, generally people bring their own materials, but we also have a store up front where we stock materials that are harder to find uh, or uh, things like electronics components, capacitors and resistors and microchips and uh, servos and radios and latex and silicone for molding and styrofoam and stuff that you know you might have to buy in large quantities to get any of in order to use it for a project. So how'd you come up with the name? Uh, well, Hammerspace is a, it's a cartoon reference from uh, American to Japanese cartoons that when they reach behind their back and pull out some tool that's far too large to have been <laughs> hidden back there. Uh, that's, that, that's Hammerspace. So we, we like to be that magic spot where you're like, hold on a second, I've got that tool. And they're like, where? You live in a tiny apartment. You drive down the street, you go in, and you use your giant laser cutter or CNC machine. You come back with this amazing part. It's like, well, I just did that on my laser cutter. I keep it at Hammerspace. So uh, we are your amazing workshop where you can come and get stuff done that you didn't imagine you could do. Time for one more. Yeah, one more question. Last call. Oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Get it first. <laughs> <laughs> What's the largest thing that you've done with uh, 3D printing? What in your terms of your capability at the hammer space? In terms of uh, size or complexity? S well, size. First of all, well, uh, there's a, this is a great this is actually a great topic. I talked for a couple minutes about this. Uh, 3D printing uh, right now kind of has a reputation that uh, you know nuclear energy had about the time we decided that Spider-Man got his powers from a radioactive spider. Um, right now, everybody thinks you can rub 3D printing on it, and make it go faster, better, stronger. Um, but the reality of it is it's got a very, very limited window of super usefulness. Now within that window, it's magic. The thing is, grapefruit. That's what you think about when you think of 3D prints. That's about the size that you can effectively print something. Uh, two bricks stacked on top of each other. That's an effective size that you can 3D print something. That's a long print. That's like a day um, if it's mostly solid. Uh, it takes a while to 3D print things, which is the stumbling block. And it's kind of a logarithmic progression on time with the volume of the object. So there will never be 3D printers that work the way these do that print really big objects in high resolution. The problem is, is just one of the way it works. It's an Etch-a-Sketch with a glue gun attached to it. <laughs> Think about how long it takes to sketch something with an Etch-a-Sketch. You've got one pen. You don't have a fat pen you can switch to on the Etch-a-Sketch. It's, it's a tiny little needle. And that's the way the 3D printer works. It's a tiny little nozzle. So to build anything, it has to traverse all of that surface area. So the bigger it gets, the longer it takes to print. So you end up making pieces that are puzzle pieces that snap together. And it's really good at doing that. And what's really nice is those pieces can be mostly hollow with lattice works on it for the infill. So the space that it's actually having to traverse can be minimized by clever design and using the fact that you just build it like you're building a structure for space or to span a bridge or something like that because you can do that. And you can build these amazingly complicated structures as easily as you can build a solid brick because it takes less time for it to build these vast, intricate, braces and supports and buttresses than it does to traverse every single pixel in a giant cube, if you will. Um, so it encourages clever and efficient design because you can build things you can't build in real life. There's a lot of parts that we're printing now that are printed in one shot that are multiple parts assembled, uh, which is where the current frontier of 3D printing is really developing is there's a lot of really neat parts where you can build something like there's a little articulated elephant that we have right now that has two front legs that hinge together and two back legs that hinge together and a ball and socket joint where the head can move around. And it has all these wonderful poses and it's printed in one shot. 
when you pick it up off of the build platform, all of these moving parts are fully articulated and assembled. There's no further assembly necessary. And it will never come apart because it doesn't have any parts that come apart. It's permanently trapped together. So unless you break it, it's good for forever. And there are bracelets and other flexible structures that we're building now that are assembled as part of the production. That's really amazing. And that, when you need onesies of things and it's for your personal use, that's where these things really shine. But you have to kind of scale them within a certain size. Once you get over that, then you start using digital tools that are subtractive rather than additive. And you go down to the hardware store and you buy yourself a sheet of plastic number seven and you lay it on your advanced laser cutter and download a file from the cloud and it cuts you a new coffee table, um, which we're doing today. And that, that may be home technology, it may be a sort of a Kinko Center technology for forever. <coughs> sort of depends on culture and the way it goes. But right now, it makes sense to share these technologies because they're expensive and a lot of people can get a lot of utility out of them by coming to centers where you can share tools well beyond what you can put in your home garage. So, thanks for listening. Great job, great job. Uh, we're Steve and Kevin at. Come on down here, guys. Uh, in the world of marketing, has anybody ever heard that saying, build a better mousetrap? What's the rest of it? And the world will be the back of your door. Right. That's the saying, and it's 100% wrong. False. False. <laughs> Market a better mousetrap. Market an average wow. mousetrap, okay? But effective... Market a terrible mousetrap. <laughs> <laughs> effective marketing, creating the awareness of the functionality of the device, and maybe a little bit of image with it, and a little snap with it. Yes, it's an art that's absolutely 100% necessary for the success of any venture, is marketing. Uh, yes, I've been in business for 27 years. I've been around a lot of different marketing companies. Uh, I'm from the University of Texas in Austin. One of the top business schools down there. But I, I've got to tell you about Fuller Creative. This is Kevin and Steve here, uh, the owners of this operation. And we're doing a joint venture right now on our Make 48 this fall. These guys are marketing geniuses. In this very, very short per time that we've been with them, some of the things they've made, the footprint they've already created um, nationwide, even in, in, in Canada, promoting this event, you guys, is nothing short of amazing. So. Lots of times people are overwhelmed. I mean, I have to have all this expertise. No, you just have to hire somebody with expertise. You don't have to know how to do all this 3D printing. And Dave, some of that stuff he's going through, I'm like, oh my God, it's not buggy. But see, I could go down there and I go, can you do this for me? And he goes, sure, I can get somebody that can. That's what ICKC is about, is not making us all experts at everything, right. but introducing you to people that are experts at marketing. And so what I'm gonna have, uh, Steve's in the blue, okay? Kevin's here on your, to your right. But I'm going to have them talk a little bit, bit about Fuller Creative and what they can do for you in marketing. And then uh, quickly we're going to get a panel up here together and, this, and field questions from you about whatever device or uh, marketing assistance you may need. But please help me welcome Steve and Kevin Fuller. Is this on? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to start with the introduction real fast. Um, the best way to think of us is we are the smallest ad agency in Kansas City. Um, we've gone beyond freelancing, beyond creative services firms. Um, we offer it all. Uh, websites, um, advertising and marketing, basic design. Um, and it's really important for people like you who need somebody who can do everything in-house. You're not going to go to this person and this person and this person. Uh, we were founded in KC in um, the Prospect, Northtown area about three or four years ago. Um, we're just, you know, growing rapidly and want to serve people doing the exciting things in the city as much as we can. So it's kind of us in a nutshell. Uh, so Kevin, oh, two of the things that Kevin didn't mention there is we also do social media management, which is one of the things that we are doing for uh, Make 48, and we can talk to you guys about that a little bit. And then about two weeks ago, we added a video division uh, from some of the local filmmakers here in Kansas City that were looking at starting up production company. I also sit on the Kansas City Film Commission. And so one of the big things that Kevin and I have focused on is making sure that we work locally. 
exactly. Um, you know, there's a lot of advertising agencies, there's a lot of marketing companies here in Kansas City, and they'll farm things out. Uh, everything done by the American Royal is handled out of a company in Georgia now. Uh, we work locally. We use local printers. Uh, all your service providers will be local designers. Everyone that we work with uh, is right here in Kansas City because we firmly believe that putting jobs back into the city, putting the people in the city to work, is one of the most important parts of being an entrepreneur in the city that you're from. You, you can tell who runs our creative head and who is our salesman and who is out there. <laughs> So I'm, I'm much better in front of a pen and a pad and then um, <coughs> coming up with the marketing ideas. Um, and that's something that, that I learned as a freelancer as I developed into an agency is that um, the best thing in the world that happens in a dark room where no one sees is not the best thing in the world. Um, you know, people have an idea that, you know, I'm gonna go on a limb. What Picasso made would not have mattered if nobody had seen it. And so Stephen is in charge of, um, was in charge of getting me out and me seen, and now he's in charge of getting us and our clients out there um, so that people can appreciate you know, what they're doing and what we're doing for them. So if you guys are on social media, I'd like for you to take your phones out right now. Uh, you can follow at go make 48 to follow your own event. Uh, it's approaching 250 followers in about a week and a half. Um, lots of the Maker uh, and Make Maker Fair events have kind of grabbed onto the account. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff on there daily, um, almost hourly posts and interaction. The engagement's going pretty well. Um, if you could what follow, media is that on? Is that's on Twitter. Very good. So uh, the next the next two will be on Twitter as well. So at Fuller underscore Creative. That's us. If you have questions, comments, just want to chat, reach out to us on Twitter. Ask us about your product, your project, anything that you're wanting to work on. Uh, we're on there all day long. And then you can follow me at, at SR Fuller. Now, if you're like me, like Twitter, yeah. <coughs> what's that? A bird, right? Okay. Yes, I promise you this. I am not good with tech, okay? I was able to set up a Twitter account in 60 seconds. It is very self-intuitive. It is super, super, super easy. So don't be intimidated or overwhelmed by that. But also it really, really keeps you hot and in the loop of what's going on on a, on a daily, timely basis. You can choose who to follow. So I would strongly recommend just go twitter.com and then set up an account. And again, it's very self-intuitive. And then under search, that's where you put at what he just, the address that he just gave you, and it'll pull up the full underscore creative, which you see right here as well, at the last sign, at full underscore creative, then it'll pull them up and you say follow. Anytime they post something, it'll immediately go to your account. So when you get on Twitter, you see it, oh, hey, here's what Steve and Kevin are doing. Hey, here's what's going on with Make 48. And so you can pick and choose anybody in the world to follow. You can follow whomever you want to know what they're saying today. And you can actually interact with them should you choose. To do so, so I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the panel, if you guys you guys know who's on it, I think if not, Kurt, grab them. But come on down here. What we're going to do? Uh, I'm going to MC it. <clears throat> we're going to have a one of the microphones. Guys, go ahead and grab some seats up here and be comfortable. Uh, but any question you have now, marketing. So, what does marketing cover? Effectively getting your product to market to to the consumer, creating awareness of it, getting people to exchange dollars for it. Okay, the greatest thing in the world, even if it's advertised very well, if nobody will exchange their money for it, where you can generate profits, you're not going to be doing it very long. So wherever you're at in the manufacturer, whether you're ready to go to market or not, I still want you to present your brief questions forward in regards to marketing. We've got trade show experts, communications experts, uh, sales training experts, and then of course guys that actually own the marketing <coughs> company. So who's got some questions here to start us out? And we're done. Hey. <laughs> oh. All right. If you have a patent pending product and aren't sure whether you want to take it to a retail marketing methodology or wholesale, what advice can you give on deciding which direction to take that idea or that invention? Oh, oh. 
Bob Coulson. Get out of the hell. He's lucky. Ever heard of crowdfunding? No. Kickstarter.com? No. That's kind of what I did. And it shows proof of sales, yeah. pre orders, and then if you have a prototype, they'll help you set up your product. Um, my product, I do both. I wholesale and I do uh, retail. So you don't have to pick one or the other. So to, make, oh, my so to make that decision, do you use what analysis? I'm, I'm not sure which direction would be better for it. Or do you do something, this word I hear called licensing? Do you just sell the idea to somebody else and let them take it? Is that a better way to do it? How much money you want to make? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, we have, I, have, we I have products that are licensed, and you know, you make four to six, eight percent. Um, Say that again. And license agreements, you know, yeah. you give them the product and negotiate. Stephen Key is a great person to talk about that. One simple idea is a book. It's a great book. Let, let, and let me refer back to you. I mean, this is like marketing 101 today. <clears throat> so let's go back to crowdfunding. Because again, when people say, like Stephen goes, well, yeah, we're at so-and-so. I know half the crowd goes, what does that even mean? Okay, and I said, well, Twitter. But again, we get caught up in speaking our own language and using acronyms people don't understand. Crowdfunding, let's talk about that. In the old days, you and I came up with an invention. We're like, okay, we need to go create 10,000 of these things. So we need to find a manufacturer. Then we need to quality test it and you know, market test it. But we need to warehouse it somewhere. Then we need to figure out distribution. And then we need to sell it wholesale or we're going to get it into the retails, whatever the case may be. But we have to have all that money up front to build all that stuff up front. You and I have to come up with that money. And you don't know if it'll sell. Exactly. Yeah, you have no clue. You go, boy, I hope this thing works out. And the problem is you and I fall into group think because you and I invented it. Well, of course we think it's brilliant. We go, everybody's doing all of these. We're gonna sell millions. Nobody might want one, okay? What crowdfunding does is the exact opposite of venture capital. Rather than having to raise all the money up front, you and me are getting angel investors who are gonna take our equity. What you do is you create a very, very short video at like kickstarter.com uh, it's it's a uh, like qvc like so it's a, bit, a functional demonstration of your product and you go here's what i've created and here it is and this is the only one that exists on planet earth but if you pre i'm going to retail them for 149 dollars but if you order them today on my kickstarter campaign you can get them for 99 dollars and you'll be the first person in kansas city the lone one then i'm looking to i need fifty thousand dollars to get this project off the ground you either get fifty thousand or you get nothing so you have to be really careful where you set your crowd crowdfunding campaign. Well, people will look out there and they're cruising around. They go, God, that thing is pretty cool. And I'll order one. And I'll order. you can have orders come in. You get orders from how many countries? Twenty-four on the first crowd. Twenty-four countries. So this is global marketing at Kickstarter and people all over the world. Now you got to figure out how to actually get them the product. So you might want to. It's proof for sales. Yeah, you gotta you gotta put all your ducks in a row first to make sure you can make the thing at the price that. Will make you money. But I think I paid sixteen thousand dollars in just postage. So I mean, you got to be careful. So, <laughs> but, but you'll find out real quick if, if it's viable or not. Right. I mean, you're saying you were, you want to raise fifty thousand, you get one hundred fifty, or you want to raise fifty thousand, you get three hundred dollars. You're like, whoa, not so much. So not to dominate the conversation, but is Kickstarter a they, or is it a company or is there a company? Kickstarter dot com okay. is where you go. www .kickstarter Dot com. Just, just out of curiosity, how many people are familiar with crowdfunding? I just kind of want to get a gauge of where we're at here. Okay, so there's several of you that are familiar with with crowdfunding and how it works. More than one company that does does crowdfunding. Yeah. Right. But again, the company is not very old. But they, I think what they do half a billion their first twelve months, and then so, yeah, half a billion. Now they get a cut. Obviously, <laughs> they get a cut. Amazon it's, it's, is their pay mechanism. They get a cut. So you're you're gonna you're gonna give up a little percentage, right? Um, but essentially, it is it is your for a period of uh, 30, 45 days, let's say you're gonna run a campaign and your product is going to be for sale to the general public, right? At different levels of entry. But you're gonna design your campaign, you're gonna to put together a video, you're gonna have photos, you're gonna have a description of your product. You're gonna set levels in which they can purchase your product, right? You'll have some awards, some give backs. If you, if you give $10, you might get this. If you give $50, you might get the first version of the product if you, right? So you'll, you'll orchestrate that entire campaign. You'll run it for a period of time. And during that period, people have the option to give their money and, uh, and purchase your product, and, uh, right? Crowdfunding could be its own 
separate night. Like I've spent two yeah, and a half yeah, hours right. talking about but, crowd. But it also shows proof of marketing. And then you can go to the next step and do like I did, trade shows. And then there's trade at trade shows you get wholesalers, distributors, you get retailers, you get them all. So don't yeah, really pick a decision. Just a question. Question. Fine. 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 Fantastic. We got additional comments here that are gonna help on help on this. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with the size of the product you're talking about. If it's a Buick, then probably no, you're not gonna make it yourself in your garage. But if you can make a bunch of them, then it's relevant to what they're saying. But if it's too big, then of course you go to either a manufacturing company that can make it for you so you can sell them individually, or someone that can license it for you. Are you talking about something that you can make yourself? Five gallon bucket size. But, but you can make it yourself, yeah. or you can go down to the, yes. and have somebody. Small scale. Okay, yeah. then, then what they're talking about is that it makes a reasonable sense as far as crowdfunding. You can also make, can you make a dozen of them reasonably? Sure. Throw them on Amazon and eBay and see if people buy them. I mean, that's the very cheapest way you could do it and um, you know just just kind of go from there and then if it's halfway decent and you want and you need a bunch of money to get a thousand of them made then do the crowdfunding and uh, crowdfunding is so important for small to medium sized businesses or new ventures because you're going to be getting people donating and they're going to be excited about this product for a for a reason that you had no idea a lot of what marketing does is that we take this product and we see it, we look at it for the first time, and we see the forest. Maybe if you've been working on a project three or four years, you see the trees. And so this is a way to kind of, for free, get basically a marketing sample. Here are the people who are excited about this product. Here are what they're going to use it for. And that way, your marketing can be so much more precise. You can shoot with a rifle instead of with a shotgun and you can get the people um, that you specifically want. So crowdfunding is a great way to basically determine who is going to be using your product. And once you know that, with better detail than you would have just been able to know on your own, then your marketers, they're already halfway there. Then they, they know who's giving it. They don't have to research it. I don't have to discover it on my own and charge you to discover it on my own. Um, but we, we already know your demographic and now we can get into the message. And lo lots of times what you'll see through crowdfunding, and again, you can do small campaigns, you do $500. We had a kid that does beehives and he said, name a bee for $25, name the queen. <laughs> yeah, like triple funded. But you can name the hive, you can name the bee. And so they don't even get a product, they go, this kid's pretty cool, he's a hustler, he's an entrepreneur, so they donated money. How long is this video? Let's, let's watch this. This is an example of what's produced. Now you say, well, I don't know how to do crowdfunding. You could Google how to do a successful crowdfunding campaign. And you'll have all the coaching out there you possibly want. I'll just take on to that. I'll just say the one thing that you, you will find out of this is that when you, when you get done with your campaign, you've had to work through some of the, clear some of the marketing hurdles, right? So I've had to develop photos. I've had to develop a video. I've had to develop verbiage. So you're actually working the marketing exercises as you're putting this together, and then when it's done, a lot of that collateral that you put together can then be rolled into your one sheet and other marketing materials that you'll need going down the line. At some point, you have to develop those things, so this is kind of a way to, to force you to do it. He made the video. Yeah. Four this one. No, that's not my video. I, I'm not laying uh, claim to that. That is not <laughs> nothing to do with it. Don't close that out and go back up. Up off to the top. Very fast. Look at that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 right here. Yeah. What? Bob is here today to tell you about the new revolutionary product called Bandit Guns. He said rubber band guns and shot guns. The Bandit Gun is the first multi firing mode rubber band gun. Shotgun style made with laser technique. The first mode of firing is a single shot. Just simply pump and shoot. The second way to shoot is called rapid fire. Simply hold the trigger back and pump as fast as you can. The third way to shoot is called the shotgun fire. Simply pump all the rubber bands to the top and shoot them all at once. Ready? Fire. 
created the band again. This <coughs> form, 14 pieces of laser cut plywood, are you simply do with the instructions included. You simply stack the layers of plywood on top of each other. And the final piece, snap them close. Take the tire faster, push them in the hole. That, that's, but, but basically you get the point, I'll just show you Friday, and then you go buy it, and then you've got proof of sales. Because when you market it, you know, you really, I don't know, I didn't know. So it just kind of marketing, but you guys are going to help me out. Also, also, too, the challenges that come in a marketing campaign will make themselves really, really self-evident as you're doing this, like like the mailing logistics. <laughs> he went out there and he goes, oh my God, I've got to mail this stuff to over 20 different countries? Wow. <laughs> okay, so th that stuff will come up. So the, the answer to your question, do you go wholesale or retail or licensing, th that will become, I think, more and more obvious what is the most successful path, but you have to have great awareness first. This gives you global awareness and it gives proof of sale and then you can start figuring out maybe how to market or I mean how to actually distribute it. Yes. I have a question directed more at Fuller um, mm -hmm. Creative. And let's say I have a product that I want to market. How do I know or even would think about having you guys market? How do I know whether I should be marketing on Facebook, whether I should be marketing on Twitter? I mean I'm not a real good Twitter person, but I do know how to do Facebook. So what how do you guys determine where something should be marketed, especially if someone's on a uh, budget? I'll take the social side and then hand it over to Kevin. So one of the things that I firmly believe in, and where we come from a family of entrepreneurs, I, there's no one three generations back that works for anybody, as far as I can think of, um, other than ourselves. Um, you just asked a, a question, but it, it was a somewhat loaded for me in the fact that you said what should I do I'm not good at that's not your job and this is what I tell people all the time especially owner operators is whatever you do whatever you sell figure out what that pays you what it costs per hour to do that thing if you're having to spend 12 hours doing something that takes us 30 minutes to an hour pay us or someone else to do that okay because you know I met with we met with the client this week and he's like oh man I spent 12 hours on this thing and I never got it done he's about to pay us for 30 hours worth of work to finish it now what else could he have been done or doing during that time he could have been selling making cold calls you know out meeting with clients and doing things that are bringing money in the door and paying us less than his salary to get this accomplished so that's where we look at on social media is if you aren't marketers if you're not good at Facebook if you're not good at Twitter if you're only great at building and creating your thing do that 100% of the time and pay someone else to do the other things better um, and that is that's across the board not just with social media that is with everything And with any business, who in here has read the E-Myth? Okay, you guys, write this down. This is going to save you thousands of hours of frustration. The E-Myth, it's now the E-Myth Revisited, so it's a revised edition. The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, like the baby food, G-E-R-B-E-R. -E I was 10 years in business when I found this book, and I was just like, I did that. Oh my gosh, I did that. Everything's <coughs> stupid that you're going to learn on your own is pointed out in this book. So you just don't do it. They say, you know, wise man learns from mistakes. No, wise man learns from mistakes of others. Read the book. Avoid all the mistakes. Anytime you can pay somebody to do something you're not good at, people say, well, i got to focus on my weaknesses. And he, look, you get paid for your strengths. You don't ever, your weaknesses, if you're a two on a scale of ten and you apply yourself forever, you might get all the way up to a four. Hire somebody else that's a 10 and go, man, I'll pay you 50 bucks an hour so I can go make 200 doing what I'm good at. And if I can pay 10 people 50 bucks an hour and net profit 150 on all of them, 
because my time's more valuable, invest it somewhere else, man, I'm going to do that. But I know as entrepreneurs, you go, I want to keep my cost down. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it myself. Worst thing you can possibly do, employ experts and then get it profitably in market from there. Yes. Oh. I can holler. No. Um, and talking about advertising and marketing outside the social realm, uh, social media is so important because it's free. I mean, it's like having print ads. It's like having a billboard ads. I mean, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you had to plop down major cash to get into anybody's living room. And to get into somebody's pocket, no way. Um, so marketing isn't one bite of the apple. It's scalable. And so if we're talking about things that are outside social media, you know, the, the answer for you is going to be different than if Dow comes to me and says, how do we do this plan? Of course, they're going to want TV ads, billboards, print ads that are all co cohesive. They all work in together in a campaign. That doesn't mean that if you don't have those things, you can't put together a cohesive campaign that's well thought out and it hits all the major markers. Um, so we, we come to you, we figure out your marketing budget, and then we're going to siphon, based on your industry, what are the most specific things that you need and you're going to get the best uh, uh, rate of return on your investment um, through those things. Because hiring a marketer, um, I have to put my money where my mouth is. If there isn't a direct uptick in your business due to my work, that's on me and that's a failure. Um, too many advertisers, too many marketers, too many designers, they're designing for their peers. They're designing to win awards at the end of the year banquet and so that everybody else says, wow, that was a really cool video you made for that person. And meanwhile, that client has gone out of business because it was really cool, but it didn't speak to their demographic. And so that's um, another thing that social media and crowdfunding have in common. You're gonna get to know your clients and then you're gonna be able to market to them much more effectively um, in areas that, that are offline. Get another question back here? Yeah. Um, Talking about the uh, like Kickstarter.com and the crowdfunding, um, it's very, very important to your business, obviously, to see if it's going to get launched. But one of the things that they say on their website is that it's very, very important uh, to make sure that your campaign is successful. So my question to Fuller Creative is, do you uh, stand side by side somebody <laughs> doing that daily creative marketing uh, for that 30-day, 45-day period? Uh, to make sure that that campaign is successful because that is the big ingredient. Um, and I'm going to make this real quick just because we already talked on crowdfunding. Basically, the most successful way to do a crowdfunding campaign is to have everything already done and figured out before you even start. Have the majority of your investors and even your largest investor already targeted and have some money already going into your project before you start now it doesn't it's not every time but the most successful ones that that i have run and i've done five man we may have done 10 through the kansas city film commission in the last year with some of our different filmmakers the ones <clears throat> that work are where they have great videos they have all their social media in place. They are running all of them 24 hours a day. There is a peak and a fall cycle to every single campaign. You have to be ready to ride it out and stay on top of it the whole time. When we are running any sort of campaign, any social media campaign, uh, the first 48 hours, my wife does not want to be around me. My <laughs> phone is going off 24 hours a day. I was telling Kurt that when we started Make 48, I basically had to move to another room because <laughs> makers are making in the middle of the night, and that's when they're reading social media. Right. And so I had to be ready at 1 o'clock in the morning for people to ask crazy questions that I probably really didn't even have the answers to. When you're doing a crowdfunding campaign, it's, it's that important and even more because you have so much writing on the end result. So that I would say be ready to be on it for 24 hours a day and so have a team of people who can do that. Work with a marketer, work with people who can do the social media. Not someone who knows about it. We get a lot of clients like, my teenager could run this, right? You have a $6 million a year company. You want your teenager to run your Twitter account? Like, really, just because they can run their personal one? Get people that are strong suited in the areas that you need 
Run it 24 hours a day. You're going to be hitting it really hard. And make sure that everyone is willing to ride that whole cycle out. Again, make sure you have a plan going into it. And it really, really does help if you know where a good portion of your money is going to come from. If you have someone who says, I'll match it. Once you hit $10,000, I'll match it. Once you hit thirty, I will match it. Because those big jumps are then going to bring more people in towards the end. Um, to be honest, I would say uh, nine times out of ten, we know ahead of time whether a crowdfunding campaign is actually going to complete or not based on the conversations that happen before it starts. Got a question or comment here? Yeah, uh, this is for Fuller uh, Creative again. Uh, how do you charge when you uh, do for Facebook and Twitter and all the, the social media? The, I mean, the same way we charge for anything. It's based up by by the hour and campaign. We have different levels. Um, you know, if you want just a quick Facebook page turnaround design, that is, you know, we kick those out for a hundred bucks. Say, I mean, we'll we throw a very low dollar amount at that. But we're managing three healthcare projects right now. One of them is local, very focused around the Affordable Care Act. Um, that's 24 hours a day across all. Uh, all markets, all social media. Um, so we give a design price, which Kevin puts all those packages together, and then uh, we do a social media price. If I'm running everything for you all day long, uh, you know, and we're using staff on top of that to run those campaigns, you're looking at uh, probably a starting price of $1,500 a month. So it's everything from $100 to $4,500 a month if you combine a bunch of accounts together depending on what's best for you. And one of the things like Kevin spoke about earlier is what's best for our clients. We have some large scale international manufacturing clients, especially in the chemical industry. Uh, when they say, I need a Facebook page because I heard about it on the internet. I say, <laughs> well, you could give me that money if you want to, but that is completely useless and it is a waste of your dollars. I want to do social media campaigns and we want to do designs for your vendors. And I, you know, being honest with our clients about what's going to work best for them works out best for us in the relationship in the long run. I would rather they spent their money on something that's going to work. And so, it, you know, that's where Kevin is kind of the, you know, his ideas come into play is because he'll even tell me, I know you want this check. I can think of something better to do here. Yeah, that's a great, great point. <clears throat> He's throwing these numbers out here, you know, $1,500. Some, I know some of us are, are in this response go, oh my gosh, that's a lot. Compared to what? Yeah. Yeah. Compared to what? That is no money. To have the complete support 24-7 of their creative minds and staff. You understand how many people are working for you at that time? For $1,500 is like the bargain of the century to promote anything that you're doing. And there, there's a couple different things you were talking about marketing. You might have a little gadget or gizmo and you go sell it at trade shows and you make a couple hundred dollars a weekend. That's a totally different issue. If you're talking about building a company or doing a licensing agreement or taking this thing nationwide or taking it globally, guys, it's a whole different world and you don't want to struggle with it for the next eight to ten years trying to figure this stuff out. Hire the pros. I, I can agree with that. that. And I think Rich, Melvin, and me can both agree. Both of us are just local inventors. We come up with a crazy product or a useful product. And as soon as I hired a marketer, a branding agent, I look way bigger than I really am. And that really set the difference. I mean, like if you click the second tab, um, I wish I could, I probably I could find it, but um, my local trade booth was horrible. So now this year, I the second tab. Keep going over. The Dropbox link. See it up top? Tab yeah, well, okay. Here we go. You know, they make you a lot better than what I was. Nice. Oh, I would have, you would have laughed. <laughs> what I had before, I mean, I hired your cousins, your friends, your family, and oh, look at me, I'm great. And everybody walks by your booth and goes, uh, yeah, you're just a uh, crazy little inventor but as soon as you change it and hire somebody like these guys you step up your game that's, that's awesome just back row in the middle here in the checks um so with the social media how are you able to calculate the roi um how much you invest there this is a good question 
and uh, it's also the wrong question. Um, if you're worried about getting into social media or uh, a, a lot of marketing, but really with okay. social media, concerned with the direct return on investment from social, you're probably gonna go about it the wrong way. Uh, I like to think of things as a return on engagement. How many people did we get in contact with? Pulling the demographics down from all the social media, supplying that back to the sales team of our clients that we're working for, and then they can go through and make those cold calls based off that list, and that's where we find the valuation. Most times we ask for a six month to a one year commitment on social media to truly dive in. I spent two hours on the phone with the client yesterday going through the Twitter followers they gained after a webinar we did and then saying, who do we call, who do we call, and just giving that list. And then their sales team divided the list of 100 that we called out of that up and they're gonna call on those. So in three months, we'll pull all that back together, see which one of them closed and what those dollar amounts look like. But if they're looking for an ROI every 30 days, even from, you know, you don't ask for a return on investment from a poster or a t-shirt, you know, but, but those things have to be made. They have to be out there. Um, if you're not using social to engage directly with your clients, that's where you're missing out. This is, this is 24 hours a day, seven days a week that you have the chance to sell, show, engage, and provide customer service. And that's one of the, the best uses. If, and again, if you are on social media and you're not going back and looking at your friends and followers on Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus and everything else through your analytics, you are doing it wrong. You are just there having a conversation. I tell people all the time, and it's like <coughs> talking to yourself. If I walked into a networking meeting with a bullhorn and was just like, hey, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, no one wants to hear that after a while. Go in intelligently, go in with a plan, go in with a partner, and then make sure that you guys are connecting. And we give, uh, besides our regular sit down, I would say we spend way too much time hanging out with our clients. Uh, we're, I, yeah, we're going for beers on Friday with three of our with clients. We already set it up, you know, we're, we're gonna have a meeting at two and they're like, well, why don't we move it to four and we'll just all hang out the rest of the night coming up with ideas. If you don't have a marketing team even on your own staff that you can work with and just bounce things off of and be there with you the whole time, you're probably doing it wrong. And again, comparatively speaking, what he's talking about is <clears throat> not so much for social media for sales, but for sales research. 20 years ago, you'd pay a, hundred, a company $100,000 just to start talking, going, could you really, really define who my target market is? Who's my highest probability of repeat customer, are they males, females, are they 25, are they 35, are they 55, are they single income homes, dual income homes, are they divorced, who's my client? That would cost you a fortune. They're doing all that for you up front, so actually, it's branding, it's creating awareness, but it's also the, the demographic profiling for you, which will be worth millions on the back end. Thank God for Facebook selling me all your personal information. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got a question there in the middle here, and we'll grab that one. But but uh, while he's taking the mic over to you, one other thing uh, I, I think I'd mention here, a couple things, is that we talked quite a bit about the digital frontier and social media. But do not forget about the tried and true traditional tools that you are going to find that you are going to need in a printed form like a one sheet for your product, right? You might also need a video, okay? Um, if you are going after licensing, these are tools that are tried and true that pretty much everyone is going to want to see. What's a one so, sheet? A one sheet is going to be a sales sheet for your product, right? This should be a very quick sheet, not overblown with text, okay? I want, I want a quickie reference of what that product is, right? So maybe you give me a drawing, you give me a picture, you give me bullet points, I want a strong name, I want a strong tagline. Everybody knows what a tagline is, right? So you, you, you've you got your product name, and then below it you should have a line that gives me that quickie one sentence that catches my attention and tells me what that is. If you can, you need to dial it into one sentence, that's your tagline below your name. So give me a name, give me a tagline, give me a picture or a drawing, maybe even a couple showing me what it is, you know, a good, good photo, and then give me some bullet points, right? It addresses this, 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 and this, and then I need some contact information. It's a fairly simple sheet. This shouldn't be overly, excuse me, complex. Do not overload it with text. That's the biggest mistake you can make. 
don't get wordy with it, okay? People aren't going to take the time to read a book. But they are going to take the time to quickly pull it up. I'm going to see a name. I'm going to see a tag. And then I'm going to see some quick bullet points on that. And if you've got a strong image to go with it, okay, you've got my attention. And that is something that's used time and time and time again. I've, I've worked with a lot of guys here in town on this. And um, believe you me, you're going to you're going to want to put that together. If you haven't, think about that and lay that out. Okay, you're going to need that. And then the video. You've got to have a good video. Any more now, that's, you must have it. Do something that's about a minute and a half to two minutes. You don't want to go long. Minute to two tops. And that video should be very, it should pretty much follow the same format that, that they all follow, right? You, you watch infomercials, you see those, right? You kind of see how those go, yeah. all right? That's a pretty good model to follow. Granted, they're going to go on longer a lot of times than what you're going to want, but there's a format there, and you're going to want to mirror that format. So give me a problem or a couple of problems, all right? Give me a couple of pain points. Give me your solution. Show me your product quickly, right? Then you're going to show it in use. How is it used? Break it down for me real quick. Show me how it's applied. And then come back and recap the name of the product, your tagline, and close. That's it. Right? So I've got pain points. I've got your solution. Here's how I use it. Here's how you can apply it. Here it is again. Thank you. Good night. A minute and a half to a couple of minutes, you're good. But that video and that sell shield go a long way. Don't forget those tools along with all the other questions. Right here. Uh, Two questions. The first one is, um, when do you warehouse your product or ship from home? What, when do you make the decision, whether on the front end or further in the thing with a different product? Have you already made the product, or is your question? No, no. I'm just kind of wondering. Just uh, for me, it was oh hell. Now I gotta make a lot of them. So, but uh, we as a family, like he said, oh I could produce two thousand of these in my house with family and friends. That's what I did. But then it got out of hand. I can't make it. They run 24 hours a day, five days a week, and it's all made right here in Kansas City. So you find, well, I'll tell you one that really helps me is the sheltered shops. They fulfill for me. They store it. They hold, they warehouse it for me, uh, free of charge. I mean, they charge me for packaging it. And then they fulfill the orders. So. That's a good one to look into. What are they called again? Shel sheltered shops. Every county has one. The one I use is called Southeast Enterprises. That's the one I would call first. Megan, I can give you your number. Guys, if you have these forms filled out, please pass them down to your right. So we collect those. We have time for one more question. Sure. Uh, we get Gene right, so up top. On time. Give another question. Okay, um, I just wanted a quick question. How do you choose your investors? Like, what is there a few bullet points, like three, three, three criteria to run through to choose which investors to spend with? I, I have no investors. I chose not to, but uh, I couldn't answer that question. I don't think any of us. You might. Well, I don't, I don't have a lot to say, so I'm just going to speak very colloquially. I'm no expert. I can tell you, through a f couple failed investment attempts, who to avoid. Because a couple times we've had people approach us for a stake, full or creative. You get somewhere down the line, and you realize this person's a bad fit. Your books have been tied up for three months with this person. You've divulged information to them that you probably wish that you hadn't. Um, so I would say, be very wary. You run your own, own course. Um, in terms of tying in with social media, absolutely look at who they're friends with. You know, look at um, other investments that they've done and ask them about the last business they were involved in that failed. If they said, nothing I've ever done has failed, run. run. Because everybody is going to make the wrong bet. Um, from my point of view, from my perspective, we're, we're kind of a cult of personality. If people don't buy into me and Steven, or buy into your product, or buy into you, they're just looking to make a quick buck, it's probably not going to be um, your best recipe for success. You want somebody who's excited, who's behind you, um, and who is aware of the timeline that you've set out for success. Because you can know that this is an amazing idea for 2018. 
it's not ready yet, and if they're looking for just a quick turnaround, they're going to rush you to market. They're going to, in my case, rush you to try to add services that you don't want to add or add employees that you don't want to add. Um, so I would just say, I don't have a lot of advice, but I would just say be cautious, figure out who knows them, and take that person out for coffee. You know, try to get them away from their talking points and just, you know, get into more who the man or the woman is behind that checkbook. Last one in the back, Can you go? Uh, for uh, Fuller Creative, besides social media, do you uh, guys also help out with uh, traditional means of advertising like uh, search engine optimization and AdWords, things like that? It, it is amazing to me that somebody just said traditional advertising. I know. Because <laughs> I'm a traditional advertiser. I might be the last one on the planet still. Um, but absolutely, we, we don't do SEO. But we're, we're AdWords certified. We're a partner um, in that. So we, we do deal with Google. Um, and we have vendors that we use for SEO. So it's just one of those, you come into the marketing fold. If that's a wish that you have and a desire you have, absolutely. We're not going to lead that discussion. We're going to get you in a room with somebody, just like he said, who knows more than us, um, and, and they're going to walk you through that. But absolutely, um, and if you know you ever desire traditional advertising, <laughs> um, we absolutely can do that as well. Because in in this era of social media, Google, the printed paper has become more valuable again. It, it's, a, it's a rare thing for somebody to hand you a beautiful ad or a beautiful business card um, you know, or, or just a flyer that's outside the box. So I encourage you guys to, to think about those things as well um, and approach kind of everything through um, a lens of looking to the old and using all the emergent new technology because people are going to try these new things and some of them are going to fail. Um, we have a tendency to jump on the latest marketing and advertising trend. Um, I've fallen guilty of that myself. I put QR codes on way too much stuff. QR codes don't get scanned very often anymore. They're kind of a dead art. Watch and let other people fail in new mediums and then take what they did well and leave everything they did poorly. Guys, I appreciate your time so much. Give me a hand. Any great job. important parts of our meeting is actually the meeting after the meeting, which our friend John, raise your hand back there, which is the owner and proprietor of the Classic Cup, an incredible, incredible restaurant down on the plaza. And he is very supportive of ICKC and entrepreneurial, obviously he owns a, owns a business. But we go from here to Classic Cup, so you can have an opportunity to continue the conversation, engage any of us one-on-one, -on -one. and it's at the cross streets of what? 47th and Central, and it's $3 draws, $5 sangrias, and it's uh, beautiful out on the deck tonight. And we kind of wait for this time of year. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 47th and Central. So we'll meet you guys all over there. Third Tuesday of next month. Make sure you get signed up on our brand new website. Get us your email. Get your slips turned in if you haven't. But thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate the support.